Welcome to the Westside Barbell Podcast. I'm here today with Jimmy Seitzer and our guest is Bill Whitaker. Bill, thank you so much for coming down. I, I've been looking forward to it. Um, we want to share some stories about your time training at Westside, but before we get into that, I'd like to know how you got into training and got into lifting weights. Well, I never really thought about that. I thought I was going to be an athlete. Turned out I was wrong. Um, <laughs> and... If you're bigger and stronger, you're always better at it. Yeah. So that's what got me started. I worked out at a place they called the OSU Barbell Club. Um, then I ran into Louie. Started working out with Louie. And was that at OSU? No. Um, started out at his, where he used to live, um, 590 Larcom, in his basement. And... We worked out there for quite a while, and then all of a sudden it was in his garage. So we'd push the car out of the garage, and we had a small place to work out in. And the more and more people showed up, and boy, that was fun. Who was uh, who was in there that time? What what was in the well, group? Well, it started out pretty much with me and Louie and Jimmy, and then um, we've got Tim Gallagher, Doug Heath. Gary Benford, Gary Sanger, and Friday nights were well, the best night of the week. We all would get together and do box squats. And as far as we knew, we were about the only gym doing it, and it made a big difference. But no matter what kind of day you thought you were having working out, by the time you were done, you had a good workout. You, you may come in with the thought that I'm going to do this much weight at this level, and you missed it. But then through the encouragement of everybody in there, and it was great, you'd, try, you'd go up maybe a half inch or down a half inch, and you'd, bre you'd beat an old record that you had. So no matter what kind of workout you're having, it was always better than you expected. Yeah. What um what was your first impressions of meeting Lou? He was dedicated to the game of getting strong and he knew some innovative things, things that I never saw anybody consider before. And then it was box squats. Um and you were going to school to be a, a vet at this time? Yes, I was in college to be a veterinarian at Ohio State University. Um, matter of fact, I think I ran into Louie while I was still in grad school. Um, then I started vet school and I basically lived right behind him for a while. Was that by accident or was that by choice? Living close to him was by accident. A house came up in that neighborhood for a sale and it was cheaper than if we paid rent. So we bought it. Um, so then did you realize from off the bat that he was different? and the way he approached training compared to what you were used to? Oh, yes. Um, I pretty much understood what conventional training was, and he came up with this idea for box squats, and I thought, well, you know, it seemed uh, give it a try, and, man, it made all the difference in the world. And then towards the end of my career there, started doing reverse hypers, and they made a big difference. I wish that I'd been there with him during belt squats and using rubber bands. Started out using chains, um, but when he'd explain it to you, it just made sense. How he came up with these innovative ideas for developing explosive strength, um, I never met anybody who, who could do those things, who could take two things that really seem unrelated and then show you a relationship that would be important in our sport. At any time, do you... Did you think that this was just bonkers and you just went with it? Or did it always make some sort of sense? I had enough confidence in Louie that I thought, even if I don't see the relationship, it's worth a try. Yeah. And uh, the only thing nobody could do is get me to get a bigger bench press. <laughs> <laughs> um, so 
Jimmy, you were the, you were the first there. Then, but what was that like having someone else come into the group? Did it add to it? No, actually, we need to get the the timeline down. Okay, Bill was the very first one. Oh wow! That uh, that Louis started working out with down in his basement. And okay. was that in seventy five or seventy six? How long had you must been have been seventy five? Okay, so he was the first one. There was also a guy who came in there for a little bit by the name of Jeff Fisher, but he didn't last. He he fizzled out pretty quick. Yeah. So it was Bill and Lou uh, down there. And then I was next to come on board in June of 76. Um, and then not long after that, the whole thing, we all got kicked out of the basement by Doris. And we're out in the garage, you know, felt lonely out there. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't it? And uh, so, uh, and that's how, that was the timeline of it. So then I'll ask that to you, Bill. What was it like to go from two to three and then from three to four people? Oh, it was great because everybody had the same goals. Yeah. See how, how strong you could get. Um, so that's why you could go in there not having a real good day or maybe not having a real good week because of something else going on in your life. With me, it's usually school. Um, and your workout wasn't going so well, but you... You could feed off the energy of everybody else, and it turned out to be a good workout. Well, Friday nights were the most fun night of the week, and that was the most fun time of my life. What was Friday's workout? Was that squat? Squat. Yeah. Um, it's amazing because Friday nights or Friday's training is still the most fun to this day. Oh, that's great. It's the one where um, you have the most amount of accessories, the most amount of shit talking goes on. It's just it's that one day yeah. where the whole week just gets culminate in this one vent when you come into working out what really there's a lot of things that astonish me with Lou and Westside but your guys' generation was uh very academic in terms of your occupations and where you're coming from and to see what came out of that because there was the nucleus for what we have today uh the equipment the the thought processes did you ever envision that this was going to end up to where it is today when you first started? No. When we first started, we didn't even really have a team. We um, would all go to the same meet. We'd hook up with some people out of Cleveland, and we'd declare our team. We usually won. But, um, yeah, you know, it was only like three or four of us would say, hey, let's go to the Region 6 or let's go to the Y Nationals. Yeah. Why Nationals was really well run. Um, matter of fact, pretty much all the meets I competed in were well done. What was that like just going to the meet as the team? Was, well, that, was that a bunch of fun or was there pressure? Or? Both. You, the most pressure you put on, you put on your own, on yourself rather. Um, nobody on the team leaned on you to achieve something, but they all rooted for you to achieve something. Mm -hmm. Was Westside known as Westside Barbell then? No. Or was it, that was kind of like Louie up in the hill? Yeah. Wow. It was just the guys that trained with Simmons. Those guys trained with Simmons. Okay. And then were blacks, were they all in the mix where everyone was interchanging? Well, they were in out of Cleveland. Yeah. And we'd hook up with some of their athletes. We'd declare mm -hmm. a team. And it was hard to beat us. Yeah. But even if Louie was not in the meet for one reason or another, yeah. he was there with you. Yeah. Um, helping you in any way he could. What was the mindset when you were training in the gym for members? Like how, how did you guys keep each other motivated and how did you keep the, um, the atmosphere the same? Because I'd imagine you'd have people come in and go, this guy's not going to last. Or was it like that? Did people just come in and come out? Well, it was a pretty sincere group we were with. So we didn't have people drifting in and out. Yeah. Um, there were a few people that we didn't declare on our team at a meet, but they'd still go and compete as independents. And um, everybody pretty much worked together. Even, even the people who would declare as an independent, um, they trained hard. Yeah. It was the three musketeers syndrome. I mean, it was all for one and one for all. And I, I called it like a multiplier effect. Um, us five guys coming together in, in a workout created an energy or a spirit stronger and higher 
than we could have done individually. And or even at another gym. Or even another gym. Yeah. The chemistry was e exquisite. Yeah. It was, and so it was never a problem being motivated or uh, it just worked really, really well. And that was all Louis engineering too. I mean, uh, you know, as people would come in uh, into the gym, he would weed them out if, if they didn't fit right in there, um, you know. Did you guys feel that you had a, a specific role or something you added to the group? Yeah, camaraderie. I was, because I was 165, the first session would go up to usually 181. So when I was done, I would help anybody I could in the second session. And when I was in the first session, those guys would help me. Yeah. Outside Doug Heath, did we have anybody smaller than me? No, no. Doug could outlift me. So. What was some of the most amazing things you've seen in the gym while you were there training? Well, mostly our gym, I thought, dominated the squat. And you'd see some people do squats with a high box with, at that time, with weights on their back that you just didn't think was possible ever to do a full squat with. Now they're doing it routinely. Yeah. One of my, one of my favorite memories was at a meet. I was a 165, and I was battling this other athlete for first place as a 165, and obviously it starts with a squat. And we were neck and neck. And that person chose to do like 580 or 585 because Louie told me as he went over there and kind of hung around their corner that that guy said there's no way Whitaker will squat 600. And then Louie drifts back over to me and says, he said there's no way you'll squat 600. So I said, give me 600. And I got it. And to this day, I wonder if that guy really said that or Louie <laughs> yeah. Lou yeah. just told me he yeah. said that. So... Bill was, um, you know, we used to, you know, yank his chain about things, but he had an, un he always stayed in 165. So most people, they start lifting heavy weights, powerlifting, and, you know, West Side Barbell, you know, you gain weight when you start <laughs> squatting, deadlifting, benching heavy. He, but he had a natural genetic uh, power base, um, and he, ne he never gained weight. He always stayed in 165, and we were sometimes scratching our heads about that, you know, but... Uh, Lou loved having him in there because he was so damn strong. Yeah, and um, and he just was a great team member, uh, and all everything was in place. So, uh, yeah, it was a it was a great time. That was one of the few places I could go where I was one of the tall people. <laughs> <laughs> and if I went to a meet, all the other one sixty fives were coming up to a little bit above my shoulder. So I thought, geez, look like a cross country runner in here. <laughs> did you guys uh, sit down and talk training, or did Louis just lead, or was there ever when you get done with a session, you could recap and go, "Hey, that was really good," or that I didn't really feel that a whole lot? Well, we did talk about the training and how it was affecting us, and um, you know, it was usually positive. And then we'd say, well, why don't we adjust this or adjust that? And like, again, you go, I go back to the box squat. Well, let's try it with a little bit higher box or a little bit lower box. Yeah, you know, I, I can remember doing maybe my squat workout was 10 reps total. Yeah. And it was just, you'd, I didn't know it at the time. I was just working on explosion. And that sounds funny when you watch how slow somebody squats a a heavy squat, yeah. but yeah, that's what you were doing is training for an explosive movement. Were you guys uh, experimenting with any of the jumps, any of that stuff back then? No. No. No, we didn't. The stuff I um, think would really have benefited me didn't come till later. I might've gotten five pounds on that bench. <laughs> Miracles um, never cease. <laughs> he, uh, 
<laughs> he also had a really good deadlift too. So uh, he was a deadlifter and squatter. And uh, thank goodness, <laughs> you know, but uh, just really strong. How long were you at Westside? How long did you stay there for? At least six years. So two years of grad school and four years of vet school. How did you manage the balance? How did you manage? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't sleep a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, you're either at school or studying. Or I, I think working out made school and studying more possible. Because it gave you a break? Yeah, a mental break, yeah. An outlet where everybody I was dealing with in that gym had nothing to do with veterinary school. So, was that was Tom Pellucci a part of the group? He yeah. was, but this was in the back when we didn't have a jack rack. Okay. So we had a rack with pins in it. And he was what, 6'5, 6'4? Uh, yeah. So it makes him, you know, eight, 10 inches taller than everybody. So you pretty much worked out with people who are about the same strength and the same height because yeah. you couldn't be adjusting things real easy. When did that jack rack come in? And was that an invention from here or is that a, a common um, device? I don't know. I don't remember the jack rack at all. We a, never had one. Oh, at, yeah. At, oh, yeah. At West Side. Right. When, yeah. when I was there, we never yeah. had one. Because there's pictures later on of the jack rack that people, we couldn't figure out how it worked or why it was there. Well, it was just a car jack. Yeah. You yeah. know, one of those old style car jacks and, and uh, they welded um, a, base, a base to it and they welded it something else an extension to it and so you're just you know you're just jacking the weight up and then you hit the lever and it, it just ratchets down and tom was almost too tall for the rack we had right and uh kevin akins destructo destructo <laughs> you ever hear of a guy breaking a shot put no yeah well it can be done um <laughs> that and he broke a bar that we all very much liked he was squatting, I think, around 700. What was he, 6'6", six, 6'7"? Six, six, Easy. Yeah. And so he's squatting about two times body weight, and he lost control of the bar at the top, and it fell down, hit the safety rack, and it broke. And to break a shot put, you have to understand it was an indoor shot, so it's like a big piece of silly putty. Yeah. Okay, leave it out in your car overnight so it freezes and then throw it on cement. <laughs> Just shattered. So. Um, is there any more stories like that you can think of of the characters or any unique events that happened when you were there? Oh, I'm sure I can. There were some. I think one, one time Louie came in, I was working out, and I did my benching pretty much in between school and studying, so I couldn't align with anybody, which probably is one of the reasons that set me back. And Louis came in to check on me, help me, and he said, and it was, I think Louis and Doris cooked a whole bunch of chicken, and I think it was for Tom and Destructo, and Louis said by the time he sat down to eat, there was nothing left but beaks and feet. <laughs> he was very generous. I was a broke student. And um, he would find me little jobs to do on a piece of property he owned and pay me. One time he gave me a pair of jeans. He said because he went up in a weight class, they didn't fit them anymore. Yeah. They still had labels in them. That was, I mean, that, that's a, a thing that Louis never lost, even to uh, right up and towards the, the last few years. He was always a, a super generous person that not many people saw. And he didn't do it for notoriety or anything. He just did it because yeah. that was just who he was. And if you, if you, know how he uh, treated animals and uh, know how, and I, I'm not sure generous is the right word, but um, how great he was towards animals. I mean, 
either pets or wildlife or whatever, that's the true nature. And that's what people should understand because I don't think you'll go very, I don't think you'll find too many people that were as generous as he was and um, towards animals. And that tells you a lot about a man right there. Uh, he, my, uh, they had a house in Grove City and they uh, asked me to go out. So I drove out and Louis in the backyard and they had a fence and there's a little hole in the fence and Lou's out there with a, a bunch of feed for birds and he throws it down and this one little duck comes under and I'm like, oh, okay. Then another duck and another duck. And before you know it, there's about 30 or 40 ducks in the yard and I'm like, that's, that, that was just amazing by itself. Then his dog Jackie doesn't care about the birds was sitting down there. Then we go inside and all these cats start coming up. And then out goes the cat food and we stay because he loves fights. We're watching the fights and then we hear scratching and then all the raccoons <laughs> are coming in. So then there's food for the raccoon. And um, that's when I realized this guy is, there's something special with him and animals. And he would go up to dogs that he would, you wouldn't even think of walking up to. And I've never seen him, any dog take a dislike to him which was pretty, and there was dogs that disliked a lot of people. And he had dogs that disliked a lot of people too, but yeah, the animals was always to the end. And the uh, deer, you name it, came into his yard. Well, my dogs liked them. Yeah. You know, I, between where he lived and where I lived, there was an alley. And in the alleys where your garbage cans are. So one really crummy, cold night, and it's pretty dark out. I'm back there throwing garbage in my garbage cans. And I see somebody walking down the alley. And then I see him. He's got a big bag of dog food. I ask him, what are you doing? He goes, I'm feeding the outdoor dogs. Damn. Yeah. And even on Larkham, 590 Larkham, he had cat food out on that porch 24-7. Mm -hmm. And any cat that was in the neighborhood or, you know, of course, his cats or whatever. But um, he was constantly feeding those animals and you just I, I just remember all the time you come up that door and there were bowls of cat food there <laughs> you know well he and doris were always good to creatures mm -hmm. did uh you guys have a that family aspect too as a training group did you guys go out together eat together do that yeah yeah we did. Yeah. yeah that that was a lot of fun um Louie and Doris and me and Jimmy. Tim Tim would join us sometimes too. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So, yeah, that was um I think that was the start of his sort of uh, you know, breakfast was always so important to Lou. Yeah. Uh, for so many years. And he instigated those early get togethers that we had. So uh, I think that was always in his mind, you know, to he just always liked doing it. And it, uh, it seemed to have changed. Uh, it either improved or it changed for the better, but whatever was learned with your guys' generation carried on to the next. And then you look at the mid-'80s is when you had, I, th I think that's around when Marcus and Chuck and all these guys came around. But Marcus took that and then created Strong Style, who's based on the same thing as having a family together. And here, West Side, when we uh, went to Bob Evans, we didn't go for the food. Like the the food wasn't like no, it's the, a camaraderie. That, that was it, and it was the it was the t well. First of all, you knew what was going to be happening at training because someone would say something, and you're like, okay, that's what's on the cards today. But it was the stories, and then it was Lou analyzing the boxing or the MMA that happened during the week, <laughs> and you're like, that was just phenomenal. And then it was just like he would talk about training, and you're like, you'd learn more at breakfast than you would in any other book because that's what it was all about. It's like, okay, how can we get this group to work better? And it all started from your guys' generation. Because the more we go into this and talk to more people, it was like everything started from Larkham. And then it just evolved and evolved and got to a point really where people were so strong that you couldn't just take in people to develop anymore. And I think that's when you kind of maybe lost some of that family aspect, but you got the you got huge numbers because the training system is so efficient because you guys have went through the the mill of like, oh, that worked, that didn't work. We got this injury, so we avoided that. We created this machine. And again, you were right there at the start of the hyper. 
if we can talk a mo- bit more about that of how that got started, how the reverse hyper was invented, I guess. I think it just suddenly appeared courtesy of Louis. Yeah. Um, and he had everything set up. It was kind of barbaric, um, but it worked out well. And then he developed the equipment, which I never got to use. Mm-hmm. I was with the two by six inch board with a towel wrapped around it. Um, but as uncomfortable as it was, you just had confidence that this made a difference. Yeah. And it made a difference pretty quick. So if I was going to encourage somebody to get stronger, boy, reverse hypers would be right on my list. Yeah. Yeah, but we were talking earlier that we were, we both remember that Friday night after that squat workout when he threw that two by six in the rack and tied it down and then put a bar in there and jumps up and starts swinging his legs. And we just, you know, we're laughing like, you know, we're busting his chops like crazy and um, thinking, oh, my God, what is this? You know, remember? Yeah. And uh, so, you know, then five, six months later, I got 80 pounds on my squat. It's <laughs> like, okay, yeah. next. Was uh, the equipment you had, was that built? Like, were the racks, were they built by Lou or you guys? Or they did he buy stuff? Or how did that work in equipment know. to the gym? I think he built that. I mean, he built that squat cage. And that was the only equipment we had when I was there. Yeah. That was it. And, it, you know, it made sense, a safety rack. So, uh, what was it, just a, a rack, a bar and plates? Was that initially what that yeah, was there? Yeah, and a bench. Matter of fact, we got a leg extension, leg curl machine that I never saw anybody use. It's so, really, I mean, it Bill was talking about uh, the bar that was the bar that we all liked that was broken. It was a you have to understand in those very very beginning days that we were using small hold plates with a not with a York bar but just a inch and a quarter long bar cold rolled steel bar mm-hmm. and we loved it because it had a little bit of flexion in there it was user friendly um so we were using 100 pound plates right hundreds 50s yeah 25s tens and fives with small holes yeah i don't think you could find it today anywhere um and then um uh, then Destructo broke it that one day. He just dumped the bar. He dumped it. You know, and Louis said, you always stay with the bar. Always stick with the bar. Never, you know, never just dump it. Well, he dumped it, and it snapped like a number two lead pencil. And, um, <laughs> you know, uh, so that was that, and we lost our favorite bar. We were, we were furious. And uh, But, yeah, I mean, small hold plates, man. Whatever happened to those, I wonder. Did he sell those off? Oh, I have no God idea. Only knows. Yeah. But we had these 200-pound plates. They were called Iron Man. That's and right. when women started training there, we called them Iron Persons. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, we'd go to a meet, and you'd take your opening attempt, and you go, man, that, that wasn't bad in the squat or deadlift. It wouldn't work with me in a bench. But because um, I never used 100-pound plates when I benched. <laughs> yeah. um, Damn few 45s. <laughs> um, but anyway, you'd go, man, that wasn't bad. That was, that was pretty easy. Well, we finally, I have no idea why, got around to weighing those plates. They weighed 108 pounds a piece. Oh. So basically, our opening attempt was 16 pounds less than what we thought it was going to be. Yeah. So, yeah, that made a difference. Yeah, it was like, wow, that didn't feel bad at all, right? <laughs> yeah. And then, you know. He got him weighed one time, and that's when he found out that. Um, can you imagine being off that much today? <laughs> oh, I mean, no. They're not even off one eighth of a gram, y- you know, stuff that they're making. When uh, you were all training as a group, how did you educate yourselves on just say the aspect of spotting and loading plates? And did it just come naturally, or did you just by time it just got into a routine? It came natural, and by time it was a normal routine. If you had one one of the beasts squatting, I knew I probably wasn't the guy that you wanted to have spotting that guy if they're squatting those kind of weights because just wasn't big enough 
to be behind him yeah. and help him if somebody needed. So maybe I'd uh, spot at one of the ends because, you know, if a guy gets stuck, if he can lift 50 pounds on each end, you yeah. can usually rescue him. And, well, here's the thing. Uh, Louis was always, uh, number one rule is don't touch that bar. Just get away from the lifter. Don't let the lifter have a feeling that there's some kind of security nearby. Yeah. We never, ever spotted each other from the back, like you'll see. Yeah. Um, when we were deadlifting, we never had that stuff you have today where some guy's got his hand right behind a person. What the hell's that about? Yeah. That's total bullshit, you know? And Louis, Louis would, uh, he was hardcore about, you don't touch that bar unless it starts heading south, you know? And that was it. And that was a very smart thing because you needed to feel as though you're the only person in the universe doing this right mm -hmm. now. And that made all the difference. He was, he, his instincts for spotting and, and uh, making sure everything went right, we all got that from him. Uh, and even today, you won't see the kind of quality that way um, that, that we just took for granted. Well, and that's what my next point was going to be that something so simple we take for granted but when we have visitors come here and train in groups if they have no idea how to work out in a group and you think how can you, this should be just like breathing you should know that mm -hmm. if one person is squatting you got two people at their side if speed squats you're going in rotation everybody has a purpose and you're like, that's how good lou was he just put you in the right position and then moved you around and after a few weeks you became a an important part to how a group functioned and that's why i wanted to know when you guys did it with that just it had to have been I guess, a small amount of trial and error initially. I'm sure. Yeah. 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 It, it just, I, so much happened that you would take for granted and, and it wound up being so correct and so right. Everything you were doing was so right. But when there's no internet and there's no, there's very little exchanging of ideas, you don't know any different. You know, it's just, it's, it, it, you know, it's like water seeks its own level. It, it, yeah. All these things just panned out the right way, m mostly because of his direction, you know. Those times, who was uh, kind of innovating in terms of equipment and training outside of Westside? Was that more bodybuilding and fitness inspired more so than the powerlifting scene? Well, I don't know. Well, I don't know either. Was, yeah, Jim, was Weeder, was, that, was, that, was he big back then? Was Nautilus, were they coming out? Oh, yeah, Nautilus was coming out. I remember that. Um, I had very limited exposure to Nautilus equipment, so I don't have an opinion on yeah. it. Um, it was, uh, it was uh, Bob Hoffman. I mean, he was... Oh, York Barbell. York Barbell. Yeah. That's, that was it nationwide, yeah. I think. Yeah. You know, uh, but you, you didn't have magazines with equipment. And, I mean, you, you just couldn't go out and buy anything. I no. mean, unless you went to, bought it from York, right? Yeah, and that, that, geez, everything was pretty basic. Uh, well, okay, there was a lot of equipment out there, but it was basic, straightforward equipment. It was nothing innovative. Yeah. Um, and nothing, I don't remember anything being used in an innovative way either. But outside of straight bars... Or maybe an easy curl bar. Yeah. I don't know what else out there. Dumbbells. Yeah. Uh, Lad equipment. And utility benches, you know, mm -hmm. that, that didn't have any adjustment to them. That, <laughs> they were just flat benches. Do you think that, that added to the creativity of how your guys would train is because you had to come up with different ways to use the same equipment over and over again, that there wasn't too much selection? Well, Yeah. I do believe that. We take what looks like routine equipment, you, you look at it and you go, this is what you do with it. Then in our gym, you'd see guys doing um, box squats or the original reverse hypers. Um, and then um, start, just when I was really getting ready to move on, they started doing belt squats. Boy, that was... That was a trip in there because not having the right equipment for that and trying yeah. to use significant weight. 
That was a challenge. And like you said, uh, Rack Deadless, he uh, he brought that whole innovative idea in there. That's right. And yeah. these rack benches we were doing, mm -hmm. remember that? Yeah, and that, that could all be done with standard equipment. Right. But nobody was doing it. When you were doing, to say, the rack deadlifts and the bench, did you have ideas of what exercise you wanted to do? Or was it every week or every so often you'd change it up, like go from pin one to pin two? Or for a bench, you'd push off a pin? How did all that come about? Boy, I don't know. I did it by feel. I didn't get to train with the guys that really um, were more skilled at benching yeah. than than me. So. We just didn't let him work out with us. I was <laughs> yeah. afraid yeah, I'd we drag were, him down. It was embarrassing. You know what I mean? You had pride. I had to keep taking <laughs> plates <laughs> off. We're talking yeah. real pride you had to keep here. The, keep the reputation in yeah. town. <laughs> yeah, I was benching. I pulled a vein one day. So. <laughs> I pulled a vein. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, he, you know, Louis did all the innovation with the, all the rack stuff. But the one that was the greatest was the rack benching. And he had the those little those pins that were stuck in there. Mm -hmm. And then you had to lift it off the pins and then you would he had three or four different pin levels mm -hmm. you brought it down tapped the support pins yeah. in the rack and pressed it up and then racked it and he discovered that the most important part of that was taking it out of those pins and bringing it down versus just having the bar resting on the support rods and then pressing up and down from there yeah and that made all the difference. We got really strong using that rack bench system. That still today, I mean, if you can, if you can rig it, yeah. um, it's just fantastic. And okay. you never see anybody doing it today. Why didn't you guys tell me this? Well, because <laughs> I'm sorry I had to wait this long. <laughs> but, um, but you are right because Louis had a very different way of taking out a bar and benching, and so did kind of people from your guys' generation coming up that we could see from the workouts or anyone who came in. Because as soon as the bar was taken out and put in position, it was just gone. You just bring it down and you blast it back up. And uh, I remember Lou used to not be too pleased if people got handouts too early, that you have to learn to take out the weight yourself. If you weren't strong enough to take it out, you shouldn't be benching it, basically, was the, the mantra he had. And the pin presses was, his litmus test, he could sit back and watch people. And if they bounce it off the pin, you're like, oh, they got no idea how to lower a weight. And if you can't lower a weight, how are you expected to uh, press it back up? And again, that all came from your guys' crew of when that came in. Were you doing any deficits, like standing on uh, box deadlifting? Was that, was that yes, there? Yes, we did some of that, yeah. We called it lifting from below the floor. Yeah. Was there um, any, what was your favorite accessories to do? <laughs> um, box squats. Um, my deadlifts, I did those in the rack and below the floor. Yeah. And my philosophy was just about never use straps because you have to be able to hold it. Yeah. Um, and if you have to concentrate so much on holding it, that detracts from you concentrating on pulling. Yeah. And I used to say, you start your deadlift from the top. Um, the longer you stay bent over, adjusting your hands, you're wasting a reflex movement. And it seemed to work for me. Yeah. Um, but I've seen other people who did real good in the deadlift do it, bend over, and adjusting their hands. And I always thought how much more they could do if they could just bend down and rip it up. Yeah. So. And would you guys share this information? Oh, like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure that I got it from yeah. training with these people. What was your best deadlift? In a meet? Yeah, or in the gym. Okay, well, remember when they had that bodybuilding contest? At Ohio State, and Arnold was there as master of ceremonies. I was not in the bodybuilding. Okay, <laughs> um, I was. I was one of the before pictures. Um, I pulled six twenty for a double, weighing about one sixty seven, one sixty eight. Okay. Um, in a meet, as a one sixty five, I did six, and as a one sixty five who couldn't make weight, and went in about one seventy two, I pulled an easy six and a half. So. 
I so guess six fifty. Yeah. 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 Well, um, was that with two hour weigh ins? Was that the rules for the meat back then? I don't know if it was. We, we yeah, weighed was in and close. we left it. Yeah. yeah, real tight, yeah. real tight timeline on the weigh-ins. Yeah, can you weigh in twenty-four hours in advance now? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. that would have been nice. Why, oh right? no, kidding. Yeah, and um, you guys just had belts. Was it ace bandages? Were they? We had some decent knee wraps. Yeah. And we had what we called squat suits, where they were a singlet, you know, heavier material and real tight. But that was it. Um, they hadn't invented bench press shirts till after I was out. So. <laughs> I'm picking up on a common theme here on the I bench press. I think I was the <laughs> the test subject in. Okay, here's what Bill does. Don't do this. So, <clears throat> yeah. We used to have guys show up from other gyms, rarely, but once in a while, and they were people of notable capabilities and they were upset because their squat or bench or deadlift was going nowhere it wasn't mm -hmm. progressing or one of the three lifts they couldn't do well at and they'd come up there and there'd be enough of us would show up on the day they came up and there'd be enough electricity in the gym that it was not unusual for those people to get their best ever at that lift and you know they didn't ever train with us they'd mm -hmm. been there for an hour but there was enough enthusiasm that it generated confidence and maybe a little adrenaline response that that athlete would have a really good day at that lift. Mm -hmm. And then Louie would explain to him what we do for that lift and they would do better. It's so. the, the atmosphere that that's a common um, factor for everyone is that you can lift weights virtually anywhere that has weights to lift. But you can never replicate that atmosphere. No. And even to this day, it's not what it was when you guys or everyone was there, but there's still something within the walls and within the equipment. When people come in, it just elevates them to, well, I'm here and this is where other people have lifted such monumental weights that very rare people don't get PRs to this day. They come in here and it just, it kind of relaxes them into uh, thinking they can go for anything. Mm-hmm. Did, was that a? Were you guys conscious of that when you were in the group? Like that, there was this atmosphere that just got better as it went going. I was. Yeah, I guess so. Because yeah. you looked, you looked forward to it. You knew it was going to be there. Yeah. Yeah. And you knew there was, like, a, you know, like a, I want to say higher power, but that was everybody coming together. That that mm -hmm. that. Uh, that There's, pot of energy that you yeah. got to draw from. We, we knew that at, at some point in time, we became conscious of it. And um, uh, and I always remember thinking that, man, if I was going to train for a powerlifting meet, I couldn't even dream of training any place else yeah. other than this, this daggone garage right here. Yeah. I mean, right? Yeah. You're not going to, it wouldn't have happened over at the OSU way. Oh, it no. It wouldn't have happened at the downtown Y, for crying out loud. And no. um this this is it. So there was that magic. I keep calling it that 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 magic of Westside or of Louis being there that made all the difference. Was that nearly more important than the training? It was as important. Yeah, yeah. Because we would have progressed without the innovation, but not as far or fast. Yeah. Well, we were fortunate that Louis had that capability of taking two things that didn't look like they should be related and drawing a relationship and it made a big difference. What would happen if something went wrong? Just say you did bad on a lift, would you get together and analyze and go get a game plan together? Or Yeah, um, there were comments on your form. Well, in the squat, after you did a squat, whether it was simple or hard or you got it or didn't get it, somebody go, hey, how come you're pulling in your foot um, farther than you usually do? Usually you go from pin to pin. Mm -hmm. Or um, you were holding the bar a little bit higher on your back today. Uh, you know, something subtle yeah. can make all the difference. Did you guys notice a, a change in Louie as the years went on in terms of his competency as a coach 
or was he always at that level and it never changed? No, he's always dedicated to the sport. Yeah, he was. Yeah. If anything, he got better. He uh, he was just born that way to 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 lead. Yeah. In this regard, you know, he was a he was the leader. We used to call him Master Lou. We, <laughs> yeah. And we would say it with an accent, Master Lou. <laughs> ah, Master Lou here, you know, and stuff like that. And that was true, but that's how we really felt about it. You know, I think something else we need to point out is the fun that we had. Oh, yeah. And that's uh, why you kept coming back. It was fun. We had fun and we had fun with each other. We, it seemed like every week uh, somebody was uh, the target, had the target on their back. That's why I didn't bench with a crowd. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you're, you're, you know, and we gang up on them, you know, so yeah. we're, we're chop busting the hell out of somebody. One, and, you know, it's uh, one day it's Bill and then it's me and then, or it's. No, it was uh, and, Louis and too. It was Lou he, too. He took some shots. So, yeah. We enjoyed the time, you know, so here we are. You know, ganging up on Louis. Wow, this is fun, man. Yeah, we get to bust his chops for for two hours. And uh, um, but you know what? That reinforced all that energy, and it made it a good time. It was you know, it was serious as hell in there. So, but but we also it offset and balanced out with this fun that we were having with each other on a just like all the time, man. You look forward to that. What what would uh begin the sequence of uh, busting chops. Who was the sucker? How did that? I'm not sure how that. No. Who, who the, how the, how that, but it would just, it was like, it just happened though in a yeah. natural way, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, how many times, Bill, can you duct tape those shoes? So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, was he as quick witted then? Oh, as he was now? shit. He oh, was, yeah. He was razor sharp. That, that was part of the fun. Right. Uh, I, you know, I, he, would, he would start it and um, um, sometimes would find something that, the, the, like the way you looked that day or the, what you were wearing or whatever, and he'd, he would start it and find a little crack and he would exploit that, right? I mean, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, Pellucci... Uh, I don't know. You know, you just, you, Pellucci was just like, um, uh, you know, you had so much material to work with with, with him. It wasn't funny. And, uh, but, uh, you know, in Gallagher, I don't remember. I can't remember with, uh, how he participated sometimes. But, um, but you and me and Lou and I think Gary sometimes too. But, man, we were. Was it a, a good way to uh, assess character in people? That if they were um, able to give and receive, yeah, yeah. I mean, we were all good that way. And and and, but you don't see it that. I mean, I don't see it in the gyms that I work out. I yeah. try to tell these younger guys, when you walk through that door, you got to act up. Uh, you got to, you know, put the cell phone in your locker. Yeah. Right. It's a community. It's a sh it's nearly a show. I'm not saying you come in the trip, but it's nearly it allows you to leave. Whoever thinks you are outside, yeah. And when you come in, you can be whatever you want to be in that day. If if you want to run your mouth, you can run your mouth. If you don't want to run your mouth, someone's going to run their mouth at you. It, yeah. it doesn't, but it, it balances out. And I think that's the magnetism of West Side in that I could never figure out why people stayed so long. And if you start like just unraveling or or like kind of peeling out back the layers. It came to the underlining, you can't find this atmosphere anywhere. No, and, in, in these commercial gyms today, they come in with their earphones and their cell phones and in between lifts, they're still sitting on the equipment looking at that. It's not a community anymore. Yeah. Well, neither is the, that style of gym. Like there's very few private gyms. And I think the best thing that ever happened or Westside does and still does um there's no charge because there's no barrier so if you come in to train you're there to train mm -hmm. and you've got a an obligation to the group and an obligation to the name west side to make sure that atmosphere remains the same when you go to a commercial gym 
their job is to make money. Mm. So there's, there's no... Never looked at it that way, but yeah, yeah, you're right. There's no way that they don't care if you train or not train. Once mm -hmm. they're getting your money every month, mm -hmm. that's... And there's a... Like, I mean, it's a it's a small group now of diehard gyms that where that is the number one goal is to make you the best you can be. And as you said, leave your phone outside and leave your problems outside. It's very rare you can escape reality for a few minutes and that's what this place does. And I think that's the been a unifying factor from each generation of lifter. Yeah, and in those early days with us, it was a tribal type of thing because you had Louis Garage, you know, it wasn't called West Side, but you had Black's Health World up there in um, Cleveland. Uh, Cleveland, and that was very tribal. Yeah. And then over in uh, Dayton, you had oh, Larry Pacifico right. yeah. in, in his group and mm -hmm. Don Reinhardt to a lesser extent because he was one of the strongest guys in the world. Yeah. And over in we're in West Virginia area. You had uh, the great Roger Eastep. Yeah. And uh, and he had a group there. But so it was this kind of, uh, uh, I, you know, I think that was the common theme then. But you're talking about the birth of, you know, like the birth of the sport, at least modern day version. And that's the way it was then, you know. But everybody got along. I mean, John Florio, uh, John Black, uh, Haas the Boss, yeah. uh, Roger, uh, um, uh, Sedaris, Jack Sedaris. Um, we all exchanged ideas too on training. Yeah. <clears throat> Nobody had a secret yeah. training method. Meets must have been so much fun because, like, that's the who's who of oh powerlifting. If you went to the state of Ohio powerlifting championship, you better hold on, buddy, because that they were the world records were being set. They were checking for equipment. Remember that? Yeah. I mean, I totaled Elite Master, and I was back in ninth place. I, I never even got a trophy. Oh, if you won and, the state um, championship of Ohio, then you had a shot at the world. Right. Yeah. That's just the way it was. Yeah. Uh, how did that work? So you had the state of Ohio, and where was Worlds? Was Worlds, was that always American or was that everywhere? It could be somewhere else. Really? Yeah. Um, what you hoped you could do is qualify for the seniors, and then if you won the seniors, you qualified for the Worlds. I don't know if it, maybe if you placed in the top three, I don't know. But um, yeah, if you won the uh, seniors, you qualified for the Worlds for sure. If, you know, if you won the seniors, you pretty much won the world. Yeah. I don't know how it is now, but it was that way then. So when you were in this basically melting pot of who's who of modern day powerlifting, did you discuss training while the meet's going on or is it before or after or how how did ideas get exchanged pretty much after yeah because you didn't want to break anybody's concentration the you, you never disrupted somebody in a gym that was actually training for something and i always thought the polite thing to do was they have priority to the equipment and if they're doing something and they're, you know they're training for Olympic power or even bodybuilding, you help them load and unload. Yeah. Um, you did anything to make it a little easier for them to get through their training. You don't see that so much anymore. Yeah. It also, there wasn't, um, we kind of, things were in generalities. So you kind of had an idea what black what the guys were doing up at black's health world and what larry pacifico was doing um and people were generous with their mm -hmm. knowledge but yet there wasn't the communication so you just had general ideas yeah um and louis was big on innovating and creating himself anyhow um he got all his he got really specific with ideas from all the the uh, Russian and Bulgarian, you know, strength uh, journals and that type of thing he would read. But, I mean, <clears throat> we knew Larry Pacifico was nine times world powerlifting champ. Yeah. Um, Louis had an idea of what he was doing, but I don't think they corroborated uh, their knowledge and, and discussed things uh, in, a, in a type of way that I ever remember. I don't believe so. I don't, I don't think yeah. so at all. Well, it... <sighs> Louis's life seems to be a series of short stories. So he would, and everyone has a short story about Lou, but um, he, when he talked to Larry, he said, well, what are you doing for your, or Larry told him you need to up your bench press. What do I do? And Larry said, well, 75% of your bench press is your triceps. And then that might've been the concept. 
and then Lou would take that and he would percolate on it and think and think and think and then it would lead to all these other ideas uh Roger Eastep he would talk with him he would talk with George Crawford uh Mike Bridges uh um oh my god my mind's going blank uh, the great deadlifter up there in Toledo, Bell, Marty, was it? Uh, Vincenello. Well, yeah, Vincenello, we another, saw him a lot. Yeah. L Lamar Gant. Lamar, yeah. Um, so I can't remember who, who someone won a best chest and gave him, can't remember who, what that guy's name was. And this is another power of Lou. He could remember the names and the, the lifts they did, but he was the reason where they got the... Uh, the six by six to eight by eights and ten by tens for uh, speed day, but it seemed to be these little stories, and that's all it took was to ignite the the spark that got the training. Um, what was it like watching Larry and those guys compete? Pacifico, yeah. Now he's one of the few people in that era did ten times body weight as a one ninety eight. He did mm -hmm. two thousand. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, back then doing ten times body weight. You were a freak. Yeah. He just owned the sport. I mean, he was the Arnold Schwarzenegger of, of powerlifting. Yeah. He just dominated and uh, it was. Was there anybody close? Uh, uh, I don't, I, I can't remember if there was anybody close, but he just, um, he just always had this thought in your mind that, or, you know, he just knew that Larry Pacifico mm -hmm. reigned as long as he wanted to. Was yeah. Ed Cohn come up in that generation too, or is he a little bit no, later? No, Ed Cohn came later. later. Yeah, he was in the nineties, uh, Mike Bridges, late eighties or early. Bridges, I lifted in meets with him. Thank goodness he was one eighty one then. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, it was kind of unusual. You'd stand there talking to him, and then you'd hear um, Bridges on deck, and you'd go, "Oh, I gotta go." Then he'd yeah. go out, set a world record, and come back and talk to you like nothing yeah. happened. Yeah, so. Saw Bridges in 1981. I think you might have been at that meet. It was up in Northeast Ohio or something. And, you know, uh, he always had Louis' respect. And uh, and I remember I never saw him before. Yeah, that's right. He, traded, he trained in Dayton for a while. Right. Yeah. So here comes this guy that doesn't look like much. He's got a T-shirt on. He's a short guy, small arms. Yeah, he's shorter than us. Yeah. Yeah. And, you're, you're in, I remember looking at him and, you know, nothing impressive then he starts to get ready for the squat next thing i know he's getting into his power suit he had his shirt off saw him from the front didn't look like much of anything then he turns around and it was like mind-blowing he had erectors that were you know louis was i remember louis was saying you know <laughs> look at the back on that guy these two giant Erectors looked like phone poles draped with skin, coming running running all the way down up and down his back. And I thought, okay, that's where the power comes from, right yeah. there. Well, I guess I, I think some guys from West Side drove down to watch him squat in training one time, and it weighed one ninety. He squatted nine hundred in the gym or something. So, I mean, he's only like five four. Yeah. Yeah. He's a nice guy. The, was um, were you guys competing when the first thousand pound squat was broke? Was that Dave Waddington? Did he do that, or is it? Yeah, I mean, we watched Waddington. We saw those guys a lot of times. I don't know if I was still competing then. Yeah, yeah. Because there's so many barriers broke from the '70s to '80s that again, people I don't think think back that far now, or even care to look about the history. Um, but going through some of the old photos we have, uh, that Steve Wilson. Wilson boys, yeah. His, he looked like. Oh, that's right. I forgot. His, yeah. Um, yeah. his arms just looked like. Monsters. You're like, how is this guy a, mm -hmm. a power lifter? Yeah. Everyone was just so thick. The spotters looked like they could kick your ass. Yeah. <laughs> like everyone back then just looked like. They trained. Well, yeah. they, just, they just looked country strong, if that's the right word. You're just like, how? And they're really running the event. And then you see some of these pictures of like. Some guys look like huge, like they're all jacked, and you're like, how? And then some people are like, oh, that guy's not strong. Because uh, there's, like, there's pictures of Lamar Gant, mm -hmm. and you're like looking at him in clothes, and you're like, oh. And then arguably like one of the best lifters of all time too. And um, 
with uh, scoliosis and everything was oh watching fun. Lamar Gant lift was yeah. was an event. Yeah. I mean it was uh it was unbelievable. This this you know this little guy getting out there pulling these weights that that you thought they had a cable hooked to it somehow. It was just amazing. And it seemed from talking from Lou and talking with you guys and other people, there was so much respect for strength that if you were a strong person, you wanted to know like how did you get that? And you just put them in such high esteem because to get to that level and everyone wanted to share stories. Now if you want to talk to someone they try to charge you like hundred bucks an hour when back then it was just a phone call or you'd sit down and you're trying to figure out why are these people so strong also your guys necks were so big like there's so much difference in uh the way physiques have changed over time um and those those pictures really like brought out a a lot of um just going to a powerlifting meet back then and now is completely different was was there always um that mix that there is today of you can have somebody who's never lifted weight start a competition uh intermix with people who are at high levels of strength or was everybody who did a meet strong hmm. it's kind of both um back in the day you followed the bar so the worst thing that could happen to you is you had to follow yourself so you might have two minutes, three minutes between lifts. So instead of rotating, having a definite rotation like yeah. you do now, you had some people who probably would have totaled more had they not had to follow themselves, yeah. especially if you were at the end of maybe the 181s or something. So you had a big bench like um, Tim Gallagher it wouldn't be fair for him, and but that's the way it was, where he'd get a big bench, and since he was in the morning division of the 181s in, in lower, he's got to immediately follow himself. And you always wondered what, what could he have benched yeah. if it was a rotation. So the rule changes have helped. Yeah. Yeah, you know. You don't get that deadlifting at midnight thing any <laughs> yeah. longer, and yeah. uh, that was uh, that was the, the meets would drag on and on because they just weren't organized the way they are today. Yeah. So, and it was you just knew this was wrong. <laughs> this is just not the way it should be done. What did um, Tim and Gary add to the group when they came in? Oh, right away you saw what they could do, and it was impressive. Yeah. And they fit right in in every aspect of the training, as far as I could see from the squat. Um, they, they wanted the same things. They worked just as hard or harder than everybody else, and they were fun to have around. Gary Sanger had one of the best squat forms I've ever seen, and Tim, boy, could he bench for back then at 181 yeah because there were no bench shirts so and did with every member that came during that that time period would that open up more ideas and more concepts or did it give more people to try out new things i think both because you'd see what um somebody did and they had a natural ability at one of the three lifts and then you found out they did something a little different and you, that could be integrated into what we do. Mm -hmm. So be very helpful. Uh, Gary Sanger and uh, Louie, they talked a lot about what we could do to improve a certain aspect of the training. Yeah. And when, when that was happening, would you guys just accept the, just say what they came out with, like, okay, we're going to try this? Like, was there that much trust within the group that Louie and Gary would analyze what you've done and give back feedback and you'd try it? Yeah, you had nothing to lose. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, you know, bring it on, you know, because there just weren't that many mistakes made. No. And um, pretty much everything you're doing is working. And, any, and on some of those occasional things that didn't work, it just got pitched out of the toolbox. Yeah. And 
is your group are you guys all still talking like in friendships yeah well yeah we, we reconnected yeah, through yeah. you know on the unfortunate you know yeah. of Lou passing and brought us back together again but we bill and i have stayed friends for all these many years um, we knew each other when we were in undergrad okay so from osu barbell club i knew him from he was an osu's gymnastics team so we always got along yeah and uh it's like i haven't seen him for when did we see each other last time 30 years ago oh yeah and it's like just back in the gym again i mean it's just which is a great thing yeah it's um you know that seems to be the another common denominator between yeah. the groups is that up until maybe the last 10 years and like some of them are still close the modern day guys but your guys is it doesn't matter no one skips a beat people who've been interacting who haven't talked in years or seen each other in years is like boom back to yeah you fit right thing. in i guess yeah. yeah yeah how how hard was it to transition out was it just that the time where you had to had to get a job, job? and make a living yeah <laughs> That seemed, was a, was it hard to be, was that hard? Yeah, it was. You, you stumble around looking for a gym and then you realize you're going to have to make your own home because there's not a gym out there that was in any way, shape, or form similar. Yeah. When I went to oh, the first commercial gym after I left, they were kind enough to let me modify the squat rack so you could have safety pins in it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and I did box squats, so of course I was nuts. That can't help you. Yeah. But. Yeah, you'd never find. You, you quickly realized that you yeah. left. Yeah, I did reverse hypers there, too. And that was another thing that, you know, everybody snickered about. Nobody else tried them, but. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Before uh, we start to wrap this up, is there any other stories or any things that you think people might like to know about your guys' training or the group or Louie that they might know now? Well, I think we were the only team in the country that had in our lower weight classes women because it was before there was a women's division. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mariah Liggett and Doris, they, boy, did they flourish. And... Laura Dodd came after me, and she flourished. So right off the bat, he had three women in lower weight classes that, boy, they beat their share of men. Yeah. When I, because I would compete in the first session, sometimes you had a ways to go before you changed clothes because there might be a bunch of 103 or one. 21, or I forget the weight classes. One time I was sitting next to Mariah Liggett because I was, I think I was either putting the wraps together for her or wrapping her knees. I can't remember. But she was lifting as a 132 then. And this is back when you followed the bar. So I'm sitting there. She's to my left. I'm in, in my street clothes. And this man plunks his butt down to my right. And he was a 132 pounder. And he looks at me and goes, is she a 132? I go, yeah. And he leans across me and goes, I'll never forget this. Hey, sweetie, where'd you finish up? And I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> and she looked at him and goes, I haven't even started yet. And he was done. Yeah. <laughs> so. Oh, yeah. Those girls, they... And then you had Susie Benford. She was... Uh, she came after me. Oh, did she? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Was, she, was Gary there when you were there? Oh, yeah. 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 He, was he a 181 or 198 when uh, he was there? 81. Was he? Yeah, he was 81. Started out as 81. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, Bones Benford. He would... Uh, boy, he had an especially large target <laughs> some nights. It would... Uh, he was Louis, such Louis, a nice Louis guy. started out, called him Bones, Bones Benford. Oh man, that you know that got it off to to a roaring. But uh, but Gary was a good lifter. He was totally committed, and mm -hmm. dedicated. Um, he's still competing to this day. Still this day. Oh geez. <laughs> I, I was telling Bill. I mean, he's had so many joint replacements and whatever. He just never gives up for a second. You know, he just 
and that that's pretty admirable. Yeah, you know, hanging into where he, the way he is. Not to mention the fact that he ran the best meet you could go to. Oh yeah, he Bad ran the Y Nationals, run. and they were run oh, yeah. so well. Oh. All made it so good. It was just so oh. organized. There were no. Um, Lengthy times where somebody should be lifting, but nobody is, and the meat dragged on and on. It, it was just done well. Yep, run like butter. It's just real smooth. Remember that one he had at the uh, the hotel at, uh, on Sinclair, and um, uh, it was a it was a Y Nationals too. And um, Ricky Crane, I saw I, at one sixty five, saw Ricky Crane uh, squat over eight hundred. <laughs> and I was about from here to you, and yeah. I thought. Man, I'll never see this again. No kidding. And um, just uh, he, his meets were just fantastic. Was there um, the personalities were crazy? Just you have some extreme extroverts and some extreme introverts, and um, I heard the stories about Ricky Crane and John Enzer and <laughs> all Doug these, Heath. The, I've heard multiple stories Matt about Dimmel. Doug Heath. I mean, you know, yeah. yeah, you had some real characters going there. You know, was it always like that when you went to meets that just say you had your own group, but you're looking over like, well, what the heck are these people doing? <laughs> well, no, nobody gets the blue ribbon, but Doug Heath, when it came to meat antics, I yeah. mean, you know, how somebody just didn't shoot him dead because they were annoyed, <laughs> uh, you, you, you know, you, you wonder, but, uh, you know, he would jump up and down and run over, hug the judges after he got white lights. <laughs> and I thought, oh, yeah, yeah, man, you know. And, um, but he, you know, just a real character, but, yeah. you know, he dominated. He was oh, he very, was very good at what yes. he did. Yeah. And, uh, and who else? I mean, he had some, uh, Ricky Dale Crane, but when he would deadlift, um, he would stand back from the bar, like eight feet back from the bar. And he's, he's going like this and he would always yell, he would always go, hello, like that. <laughs> always, every before every deadlift pull, he would yell, hello, run up to the bar, bang. And he was, you know, he was just so strong. Yeah. Uh, I think, so, with, uh, was it Ricky, was it his dad carried his gear bag everywhere? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Louie told me there's a lot of, like, it's just amazing stories, these little quirks with everybody. Yeah, his, his, he and his dad, that was the team. I think his, his, his whole family was there. I mean, his mom and sometimes brothers or sisters i mean yeah. it was a from shawnee oklahoma yeah and he was a badass 165 is that where the oakley bar came from the oakley deadlift know. bar i don't know why i thought he was behind that was there any more characters like that that you can think of jack sideris was kind of like um he was an interesting study uh he was uh very 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 intense Right. And mm -hmm. um, he was one of the first men that's a 198, maybe it was a 220, but he's one of the first to squat over 800. Wow. Yeah. And he just had this intensity about him. You, you thought he just kind of like stayed back a little bit. It, it was palpable. Mm -hmm. um, and then Haas the Boss, he was kind of like a big gregarious kind of guy that everybody liked. Um, John Florio, everybody loved John Florio. He was just a great lifter, so dedicated. And uh, probably would get Mr. Congeniality, you know, in the yeah. state. Everybody loved John. Um, and uh, John Black was mm -hmm. um, kind of uh, uh, kind of like the Al Capone that ran the whole mob, <laughs> you know, a little bit. And uh, yeah, I mean, everybody you could everybody had their own uh, personality traits. You know, Matt Dimmel. You were you you weren't here when Matt was. No, he was just coming on the scene. Yeah. And yeah. he was just drifting out. He was intense. But, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of Vincentello, incomparable. Mm -hmm. When it came on deadlifting, it's just like you just stand back and watch it happen. Yeah. We, we uh, found a, a, a really good photo of Louis and, and Vincentello. Yeah. Uh, together at a meet. It's, Watching uh, him deadlift was a real thrill. Yeah. Did you ever meet George Crawford? Yeah. Yeah. I remember. Was he as out there as the stories? I never saw that aspect. I think I only yeah. saw him compete once or twice. And that was really, I know you, you had to have seen George Crawford. 
and was it Marty Bell? His his site that um, I'm not sure it got the first name right. I think it was Jerry. Jerry Bell. Yeah, that's right. Jerry Bell. Those two guys were Batman and Robin in a way. They just were dominating uh, in those lower weight classes, mm-hmm. and they were nobody was touching them. Mm-hmm. No, Jerry Bell. I think had a real big deadlift. Right. Yeah. Louis Louis really respected what he was doing. He would refer to the kind of training he was doing, or if I remember correctly, you know what that any, anything those two guys were doing up there in Toledo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think we'll wrap this up here. I appreciate your time, Bill. Well, Jamie, it was fun coming so down. Yeah, it means a lot, and hopefully, this is the the first of many, not the first of last. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Take Tom. Care.